Breaking tonight, the generals push harder on the commander in chief as a growing number of military leaders openly worry about the president's plan of battle against the terror threat in the Middle East. Welcome to the Kelly File, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. President Obama stepped to the microphone just a couple of hours ago, trying to reassure the country that he has a plan for defeating the terror army known as ISIS without putting any American troops in a combat role. The American forces that have been deployed to Iraq do not and will not have a combat mission. Their mission is to advise and assist our partners on the ground. The President of the United States, in no uncertain terms, saying there will be no combat mission. There isn't one now, and there will be none. In the last few days, we have seen four high-ranking U.S. military men suggesting the President reconsider that strategy. General Dempsey, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Odierno, former Secretary of Defense Gates, and General Zinni all saying that President Obama should not be ruling out combat troops. But what do they know? Last night on the Kelly File, Colonel Oliver North issued a challenge, saying he is waiting for a general to stand up and say the president's pledge to defeat these terrorists is impossible without ground troops. Today, General James Mattis, the retired head of Central Command, which oversees this region, pretty much did something akin to that. Watch. We didn't look for this fight, but once you go into it, you don't tell your adversary in advance what you're not going to do. I think that uh, this strategy has many of the right elements to it. I don't think it goes far enough. I still would not take any element of America's power off the table. And that's not just military, but it certainly includes the best military in the world. I'm not saying we'd have to commit them right now, but certainly don't uh, pull it off the table. Sir. When you tell an enemy how long you're willing to fight, you give that enemy hope. We have the most skillful, the fiercest, and certainly the most ethical ground forces in the world. And I don't think we should reassure the enemy in advance that they'll never face them. The world does not need a demonstration of American impotence. We have got, if we decide to go after ISIS, it's got to pay a price to the point that other countries in the region, including Jordan, feel like they, are, they have a fighting chance against this enemy if they stick with us. Hmm. General Jack Keane is chairman of the Institute for the Study of War and former Army Vice Chief of Staff, and he joins me now. Good to see you, General. And let me, let me just start with what your reaction is now to what we heard from General Mattis and what we've seen from those four other generals coming out and saying the president has misstepped here. Well, I, I share their views. I mean, we listened to the president's speech last Wednesday. He defined an end state, which I think everybody agreed with, defeat and destroy. And he, dis, he defined a general framework which seemed to satisfy most of us in our concerns. But then since the last week, when all the details came out about what is the actual implementation plans, we have fundamental concerns. First, the air campaign is critical but it won't be decisive, but it's very important. Why aren't we bombing Syria now? It's seven days later, those targets are exposed. Support infrastructure, training areas, supply bases for troops and equipment, command and control. The longer we wait, Megan, the more opportunity we have for ISIS to protect and conceal those right. targets. And there are reports the today ground, that they're doing exactly the, that, that they're reportedly moving into the inner cities and they know that they've got time to abandon their posts so they can get to a spot that we are unlikely to bomb from the air. The truth be known, and I wish I had said it the night that you asked me to comment on the president's speech, but I didn't think about it until I was going home in the car. And the fact of the matter is he should have been bombing that night and he should have been announcing that campaign that night that would have taken them by surprise because I'm convinced that one of ISIS planning assumptions, given the president did not cross the red line to do airstrikes in Syria a year ago, they believed they would not strike them in Syria. That's why they bunched up so much stuff in Syria. The second issue, really, Megan, and this is what the generals are talking about. This is what General Dempsey is nuanced about in his comments and, and General Odierno, you know, carefully parsed his words and, and what he was saying. And certainly General Mattis and others being retired can speak more openly. The issue is the ground campaign is what will destroy and defeat ISIS. 
But we got a weak hand in the ground campaign. Weak in Syria with the Free Syrian Army that needs to be armed, equipped, and trained, and we've been refusing to do that for three years. Now we're going to do it, but we're not going to do it robustly. And in Iraq, we have an unproven ground team in the Iraqi army, the Peshmerga, and the Sunnis. They've never worked together. Not only that, but they've had problems fighting ISIS. So what General Dempsey and General Alston at Central Command have been trying to do and what they've been presenting to the president, knowing we have a weak hand on the ground, they want to strengthen that hand to have success, increase it. So what does that mean? They want, they want advisors and air ground controllers down with the fighting units. That clearly is boots and troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. They want JSOC Special Operation Forces direct action teams to take down the ISIS leadership kinetically. That means combat forces, but limited to do that. We did this every night in Iraq and every night in Afghanistan. And believe me, when you go after these leaders, things begin to change rather dramatically on a battlefield below them. All right, let me, let me, also let, let me ask you this, because Nancy Pelosi was asked about this today, and what she said was, and I quote, then they're done that when it comes to combat troops and we're not doing it. She's pointing to the Iraq war and that situation as a justification for not sending any ground combat troops of Americans there now. Well, that's, that, that's a misunderstanding of the facts and quite an absurdity in that statement. By the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009, President Bush's surge strategy, led by General Petraeus and General Odiano, now the Chief of Staff of the Army, defeated the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They actually, I saw the transmissions because I was advising Petraeus on the ground in Iraq they showed me the transmissions from al-Qaeda that they were intercepting. They said, we are defeated, don't send any more foreign fighters. Wow. So we knew how to deal with this enemy in that, in that category. What happened to us, and I don't want to go back and you know, replay all the mistakes, but the fact is we didn't leave a force there and we're paying a huge price for it. Last question. For not leaving something to help the Iraqis. Can you speak, it's extraordinary to see all these generals come out, the ones who are working for the administration now saying as, as strongly as they can, given their current positions, uh, that they are disagreeing with the commander-in-chief's strategy here. Speak, if you can, to the president's relationship with the military right now. The frustration level in the Pentagon among the military and in the Central Command Headquarters, who is overseeing the war, with the president in the White House is as high as it has ever been. But this president has overruled our commanders time and time again from 2009 to the present, Megan, and it's been very frustrating for them. McChrystal and Petraeus wanted 40,000 troops to go into Afghanistan as part of the surge. The president gave them 25 percent less, or 30,000. They wanted the force to stay there for a couple of years. The president pulled it out after 11 months over the objections of General Petraeus. Mm -hmm. General Alston, who's now the Central Command commander, when he was running the war in Iraq, at the end of the war, made a recommendation for 24,000 troops to stay in Iraq. The end result was nothing. General Dunford, the Marine Corps commander of Afghanistan, and the Central Command commander, now General Alston, made a recommendation this year to the president to keep a residual force in Afghanistan. He has rejected that and said no. And that, now he is rejecting their recommendations to win this war with ISIS. And also, he's rejecting what they absolutely need, and, and, and what is the noise you heard out of General Dempsey, is that if, if this weak hand fails, we need U.S. combat forces to come in and take over. Mm -hmm. And that is still not an option. Mm -hmm. And the question remains then whether the commander in chief is in effect setting our own troops up to fail. We're going to take that up a little later. General Keene, thank you so much for being here tonight. Glad to be here as always, Megan. Also tonight we are learning about an intelligence bulletin just coming to light, one that warns about radical Islamic extremists trying to encourage followers to seek out, ambush and murder American military personnel on U.S. soil at their homes. Trace Gallagher just got some more information from the Department of Homeland Security. Trace?
And Megan, the information in this law enforcement bulletin is based on credible sources and an uptick in chatter on internet forums. It says that Al Qaeda inspired groups like ISIS will switch their focus and instead of recruiting radicalized young people to get on planes and join battles in the Middle East, they will encourage these lone wolf terrorists to carry out attacks against U.S. military personnel on American soil. The bulletin warns that military members will likely be targeted in spontaneous ambush style attacks, similar to the May 23rd. Machete attack on a British soldier by two British citizens who then explained the attack to a witness. Remember this? We must fight them as they fight us. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We ap I apologize that women had to witness this today, but in our lands, our women have to see the same. That killing prompted its own law enforcement bulletin, but now authorities are updating the threat to reflect the increase in calls from terrorists for Muslims to wage jihad at home. Even citing a Twitter post encouraging jihadists to use social media to find service members' names and addresses and, quote, show up and slaughter them. Another post says, quoting, why kill just one when you can follow General Nadal Hassan's path? Major Nadal Hassan opened fire at Fort Hood, killing 13 and wounding 32 others. Clearly, the homegrown terror threat isn't limited to the U.S. and U.K. Australian authorities launched the country's biggest terror raid in history today, arresting 15 suspects accused of planning to attack and behead random citizens on behalf of ISIS. Recently, Australia began canceling passports for people believed to be going to the Middle East, but experts point out that keeping would-be terrorists at home can increase danger dramatically. Megan. Trace, thank you. Well, the threat of those lone wolves may not be the big worry tonight. Up next, new details on a terror concern involving U.S. planes and more in what could wind up, God forbid, as a 9-11 style attempt uh, in an attack. Plus, Republicans and Democrats today questioning our Secretary of State and our Secretary of Defense raising concerns about the administration losing the credibility to lead. My question is, is, is the administration really being straight uh, with the American people uh, when you keep emphasizing no uh, boots on the ground?